All right, it is seven o'clock. So let me kind of give you just a, a rundown of how this is gonna work. Um, so I have discovered some really fun software um, to where I can show you PowerPoint um, and you can see my face while I'm doing this. And um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, you should see my little setup here. I feel like I'm surrounded by uh, electronics. But, um, so um, this is a 12 week study. Um, and because we're gonna be going from Genesis to Revelations, there's no way that we can cover every single thing. There's just no way we can. So this is gonna be really, really high level. And um, I'm only going to be able to cover certain points um, and just try to hit some highlights of scripture. Um, tonight, we're really just going to do an introduction to the Word of God, um, to the Old Testament, and then um, we'll talk about creation and the fall and um, the judgments at the end. So that's kind of the agenda for the evening. I don't know if you all saw it or not, um, but I did post um, a picture of the outline that we're going to be covering this evening. Um, so... Uh, please make reference to that. It's on my timeline. Feel free to grab that. Um, hi, Pat. Hi, Marlene. Hi, Linda. Um, good to see you all online. Um, so let's get started. Um, so give me a minute because this is brand new um, software for me. <gasps> Carolyn Tibbet is on here. Hi, sweet pea. I want to type your name in all caps so bad, but I won't do it. Carolyn Tibbet, that's about as good as I can get it. Um, but here is um, what the PowerPoints are going to look like. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through those and um, we'll get started with our study. So here we go. I need her. I saw you. i gone. Um, we're going to start with just a simple introduction to the Old Testament. Now, um, the way that we're going to cover that is that we're going to cover it in four time periods, uh, just to make it simple, um, nothing other than. So the first time period is, uh, I love you too, um, Carolyn. Um, the first time period that we're going to cover is the time period of innocence, and that actually began with creation um, of the world and Adam and Eve. That was considered a time of innocence. Um, we do not know how long that time frame really lasted. We just know that it happened. The second time frame um, that we find within the Old Testament is we're going to call that the time of conscience. Um, and that's the time frame between the fall of man um, all the way to the patriarch Abraham. The third time frame is um, considered the time of the patriarchs. So we're going to say that that's the time of from Abraham to Moses. And then finally, the last time period that we're going to talk about uh, in the Old Testament is the time period of the law and the prophets. And we consider that time period from the time of Moses all the way to the timeline of Christ. Our lesson tonight is really just going to cover that very first time frame of innocence. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about creation. Um, we're going to talk about that time of innocence and that uh, judgment. But before we actually get into that, let me lay just a little bit of groundwork with um, just how the Old Testament is put together, um, how it came to be. And um, the books of the Old Testament, just kind of some um, how it's all laid out. So let me share that slide with you. Um, so you can see here that um, we're just going to talk about the books of the Old Testament. And um, let's talk about this first little highlight right here. The Bible really is the inspired word of God. For, or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says, 
For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. By that scripture and by other scriptures, and there's all sorts of other scriptures that we could refer to, but we know that the Old Testament, at least, if not just uh, not also the new, um, was inspired of God. But we get to the New Testament and it talks specifically about all scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16. And the word would tell us that all scripture. So we could say that all Old Testament as well as New Testament scripture is inspired by God. When we talk about um, the scripture being God breathed or being inspired by the Holy Ghost, um, it's not just that men sat down to write down a book about God. That was not the point. When we get to the word of God, this is not just man's thoughts about God. In fact, that's not really it at all. It's honestly God using men to give his word to us. So when we say that the word of God is inspired or God breathed, what we're actually saying is that it's almost like a ship that is on um, the water and it's got its sails up and there's wind and it's just blowing and it's moving that ship along. The power of the wind is what caused the ship to move. When we say that the word of God is God breathed, what we're really saying is that the spirit of God moved on men and then men responded to that and wrote the word of God. That's what we mean when we say that the word of God is inspired. The second thought that I want to talk about is the thought that the Bible is the word of God. When we say that the Bible is the word of God, we have to keep in mind that when we approach the word of God, that we must approach it with reverence, because this is not just the word of man at all. It is the very words of God to us. So we must keep that in mind and hold on to it with absolute reverence. That means when we're talking about the word of God, um, we are actually commanded to not add anything to it or to take anything away from it. You could read passages in Deuteronomy 4.2 that says, you shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. You also find a similar command in Proverbs 30 and 6. Um, but the one that I always tend to go to is the one in Revelations chapter 22, verse 19. And this is what it says. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. That's a little scary, isn't it? To think that, um, <laughs> that, it's, that God's going to bring judgment. If we take away from it or we add to it, we need to approach the word of God with absolute reverence. The next point is the fact that God's word is to be preserved. God didn't just give his word to mankind. He promised to preserve it forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, God said, but my word is forever settled in heaven. That's pretty important. God's word is to be preserved. Now, going back to, um, to our chart, let's talk about just the way that um, the Old Testament is structured. 
So we know, like I said, let me go back to that, um, that there are 39 books in the Old Testament. So an easy way to remember that is that there are three letters in the word old. There are nine letters in the word testament. Three and nine makes 39. There are 39 books of the Old Testament. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, it covers about 3,600 years of history. Um, it took about 1,500 years um, to write the Old Testament. And then the Old Testament is divided into four sections. So there's the five books of the law, the 12 books of history, the five books of poetry, and the 17 books of prophecy. Now, you will probably hear people talk about um, the major prophets and the minor prophets. When people talk about the major and minor prophets, they're talking about um, the first five uh, books of prophecy are called major and the remaining books of prophecy are called minor prophets. Now that has nothing to do with importance. It has just simply everything to do with the size of, um, of the book itself. So don't worry if you hear somebody saying major and minor prophets. That's really just talking about the size of the book. Now the fun part is getting ready to get into creation. So let's talk about creation, the days of the week of creation week. So the Bible tells us in the very beginning that God created the heaven and the earth. So let's talk about this first day. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's just as simple as God simply speaking out and saying, let there be. The scripture would tell us in Genesis um, chapter 1 verse 2 that the earth was without form and void. And while I don't have time tonight, maybe one of these days we will. But when we talk about the, the it was just without form and void, um, the original Hebrew context and even Egyptian context, but again, that's a whole other discussion. It means that basically God shed some light on the chaos. And that is a wonderful thought to consider that God knows how to shed light on the chaos of our lives. Day two, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. God called the firmament heaven. Today we call that the sky. Um, and this firmament then divided um, the, the top heavens from the bottom waters. So as I was studying this and as I was thinking through this, I got really excited. Um, I got super excited about this, thinking that when God separated the firmament, what he really did was he created a space. He created a place where you and I could dwell. The firmament, the top sky that we call that, um, that really kind of protects us from those upper waters. Those upper waters protect us from the heat of the sun and such. And then, of course, we've got the waters beneath us in the seas and the, and the oceans and lakes and what have you. But did you ever stop to think about that space in between the firmament? God created a space for you and I to dwell in. What an awesome thought. What an awesome God that he wanted so bad to create that space for you and me. Day three. The third day, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. He called the dry land earth and the gathered waters seas. 
on the same day, God also said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed, the fruit uh, tree yielding fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth. Um, so the third day, God separated out the dry land. He made the seas and the waters go into their own place. And then he created all the grass and the herbs and the fruit trees and um, the strawberries and the blueberries and all those good keto fruits that I could eat. Praise the Lord. Um, but that's what God created on the third day. So let's talk about day four. On the fourth day, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. On day five or on day four, I'm sorry, God made the sun, the moon, the stars um, divided the light. From the darkness to mark the days, the seasons, and the years with the the signs. So not the zodiac signs. I'm just talking about the signs of, of the, the moon and the stars showing up at night and the sun coming along during the day. On day five, um, on the fifth day, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving um, creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So by God's spoken word, he created the great whales and all the fish, all the seafood, all the seafood. See, I'm, I must be hungry, but I'm not. Uh, but he created all the sea creatures and even all the birds on day number five. But it's day number six that means an awful lot to you and me. On day six, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God made, God created man in his own image. He made both male and female. And God said unto them, be fruitful, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God said, I'm going to create all the land animals and man on day six as long as you continue to read in genesis chapter one what you find is that humankind is the only creation that god commanded to have dominion over all the creatures to subdue the earth and the only creature that was made in the image of god that's going to be really, really important in the next part of this lesson. Day seven, then, is when God rested. God completed his creation on day six, and he rested on day seven. Thus, he set a pattern for you and for me that we are to work. And if you read the law and the prophets, you will actually see that God said, I've created this so that you would know days one through six, it's a good day to work, but you need to take time out to rest. Your body, your spirit, your mind needs a day of rest and to be honest with you, that's something that I tend to struggle with, that the Lord has really been dealing with me about specifically this year, about learning how to take the time to rest. God put it in creation. And so we need to make sure that we follow that same pattern of work and then 
rest. When we rest, we rejuvenate ourselves so that we can get back to work. That brings us to actual creation. But when we're talking about creation, we have to talk about the power of choice. When God um, created Adam and Eve, we're, we're looking in Genesis. We, we look at Genesis chapter two. It gives us a nice new overview um, of the creation of Adam and Eve. It tell, tells us that God created a garden, planted it. Um, eastward in Eden, he placed Adam in that garden. It was a beautiful place, um, a place that had every tree that was pleasant to sight, pleasant for food. Um, and that's where God put Adam and gave him some instruction. But I was again struck by the thought of not only did God create a space in the firmament, but now he created a special space in which Adam and Eve were to dwell and to live. And that always just reminds me that God has a space, a place for you and I to dwell in so that we can experience his presence. We can experience his power. We can experience his provision in that space God has created for us. When God put Adam and Eve into the garden, well, he started with Adam. Adam was the first inhabitant of the Garden of Eden. God gave Adam a commandment and he said, you can eat of every tree in this garden with the exception of one. Just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. Otherwise, it's golden. You can eat whatever that you want. Then God does what God always does. And he brings an illustration into Adam's life. The Bible tells us that God created from the dust of the earth all the animals and brought them, paraded them, really, before Adam so that Adam could name them. And he did. And then it's almost like a light bulb goes off and God points it out and says, it's not good for man to be alone. So I am going to make him a help me. And so God puts Adam to sleep and the very first surgery in scripture is performed. And God takes a rib out of Adam's side, creates Eve and brings Eve to Adam. And because Adam was already in this groove of Naaman, Adam looks at Eve and says, you're a woman. You were taken from my side. You are bone of my bone. You are flesh of my flesh. I call you woman. In the middle of all of this, Adam and Eve, I'm sure they're having a wonderful relationship. No arguments, y'all, in marriage. No, uh, no fights, no tiffs, none of that kind of stuff, I'm sure, because it was perfect. Um, but in the middle of all of this, we have to keep in mind that not only did God create Adam and Eve, not only did God create a perfect garden, not only did God create a perfect space, for Adam and Eve to dwell in, God also gave Adam and Eve a will, a choice, the power of choice. They weren't robots. They didn't have to uh, do every single thing that God said. They had a choice in it. They could choose to obey God or they could choose to disobey God. They could choose to love God or they could choose to not love God. That brings a question to me. And please feel free to type your uh, response because I am watching. Um, would you rather somebody love you because they wanted to? 
or because they were made to. See, the truth is we want somebody to love us because they want to love us, because they choose to love us. And when God created Adam and Eve, God made sure that Adam and Eve had the choice. They could choose whether or not they were going to love. That makes choice super important. So I've got a question for you. Will you serve the Lord because you want to? Or because somebody's making you to? I certainly hope that you serve the Lord Jesus because you just love him. It's your choice. Let's talk about the fall. Chapter three of the book of Genesis talks about that horrible, terrible choice that Adam and Eve made. There's always a consequence to our actions, isn't there? There's always a consequence to if we choose to do wrong or to do right. Consequence doesn't necessarily mean anything bad. It just means simple outcome of our choices. And they made some terrible mistakes. Eve, for whatever reason, girl, she started going near that tree. Why in the world did she go even near the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? She should have stayed away from that there tree. Have you ever had something in your life that um, really was a temptation to you? And you finally said, you know what? I just got to stay away from that. That is too big of a temptation. Now, the easiest temptations to look at is food. I must be hungry, y'all. What's my deal? The biggest temptation could be food. If there is a food that really tempts you and you know that it's bad for you, stay away from it. It's a mistake to get near it. Don't fall to the temptation because you got just a little too close. Getting too close to temptation will cause you to fall. And I don't want any of you to do that. The Bible tells us to not make any provision for the flesh. In other words, don't allow yourself to get near a place of temptation. So that means you got to know what your temptations are and you need to avoid them. Then we have the lovely visit of Satan. Apparently, he decided that the best way that he could circumvent God's authority and God's dominion, because that's what it was about, was to tempt Adam and or Eve into disobeying God. And so Satan looked for the right opportunity, just as he always does today. Satan saw Eve around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, decided to manifest himself in the body of a snake, and begins to tempt Eve and talks to her at some point in time and says, Yay, half God said, hmm, did God really say? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. See, that's Satan's first attack, isn't it? To question, did God really say that? God ever promised you something? And then somewhere along the lines, you're like, mm, did God really give me that promise? Did God really say that to me? If it was a word from God, then that is Satan trying to discredit the word of God. Be very careful. When you know God has spoken to you, hang on to it. The next um, part of what we see that Satan tends to do is 
give a wrong interpretation of the word of God. Did you catch that? Satan says, he says, did God really say you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, that sounds really similar to what God said, but let me read to you what God actually said. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, God said, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Did you catch the difference? God said, you have this whole place. That you can eat the fruit of. Just don't touch that one tree. That one little bitty piece. Just don't touch that. But you've got all this whole rest of the garden. That you can eat from. And Satan comes in and says. Do you see that one tree? You can't have that. And blocks the view. Of everything else. It's a trick that Satan uses. Every single time. He points at what. You can't have compared to what God said you could have. It's a trick. And Satan does it all the time. Don't get caught in that tactic. Watch it when Satan tries to pull scripture out of context. That's why it's so important to know the word of God. It's so important to know really, truly what the Lord actually has to say. We must know the word of God so that we can properly defeat the enemy when he comes walking. Eve didn't know the word of God. You find in her conversation with Satan that, um, After Satan says, did God really say? Eve said, well, God said we can eat of all the trees um, that are in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we're not to eat of it. We're not to touch it unless we're going to die. Eve didn't know the full truth. God didn't say to not touch it. So just be really, really careful on whether or not you know the word of God. Satan also tends to attack God's motives when he tempts us. Did God really do that? Satan says, then he says, you're not going to die. God knows that the day that you eat of that tree, you're going to get all sorts of knowledge. Your eyes are going to be opened up and you're going to be like God. Knowing good and evil. Satan made it look as if God was keeping something good from Adam and Eve. What a trick. He also made Eve believe that she wasn't who she really was. Eve and Adam were made in the image of God. They had the thumbprint of God on their lives. And yet Satan said, "Mm, you don't have that. You're not good enough until you eat of this tree. Until you disobey God, you're not really good enough. Anybody ever been tempted like that? It's a trick that Satan uses all the time. So Eve ends up taking, partaking of the fruit. She gives it to Adam to eat. And the scripture says that Adam ate. And it looks as if Adam ate willingly and knowingly. Scripture doesn't tell us that Adam was deceived, but he ate anyway. Adam knew apparently exactly what he was doing. But here's the thing, they eat, they disobey, and then, uh uh-oh, God comes walking in the garden. God comes and he starts saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? 
What happened to you? Where are you hiding, Adam? I'm trying to find you. Adam says, finally, I heard your voice and I was scared. Kind of like a kid, huh? When they're in trouble, when they know that they've done something wrong, <laughs> they hide. The kids aren't the only ones that do that, are they? You and I, sometimes we sin. And when we do, we're ashamed. And we hide from the very God that can help us with it. Don't hide from the Lord. He's coming after you just like he came after Adam and Eve in the garden that day, searching, looking, seeking. Where are you? I pray you hear Jesus saying that to you tonight. Where are you? God's coming and he's looking after you. He loves you so much that even when you've done wrong, he's in passionate pursuit of you. And that's exactly what happened in the garden. God came looking for Adam and for Eve. And when they finally come out of hiding, they said, we were ashamed. We were naked. We messed up. God said, who told you that you were naked? Who condemned you? Just like that, God seeks for us. I just feel like maybe God is trying to draw somebody to him. It's okay to take the time right now and reach out to him because he loves you. Because he's seeking after you right now. But let me get on with this Bible study. We're almost done. God begins to ask Adam and Eve what happened. And Adam does what everybody does now. Adam said, the woman that you gave me, she made me eat. I never caught this until about a year or so ago that Adam wasn't really just blaming Eve. He blamed God. He blamed God. God, the woman that you gave to me made me do this. He blamed God. He would not take responsibility for his actions and would rather put it on somebody else. It's always easier to point out rather than to point in. And that's exactly what Adam did. When you get to God talking to Eve, what does Eve do? It was the serpent. It was the snake. It was his fault. Now, was it really? I mean, he tempted her, but she was the one that did it. It is human nature to blame somebody else. That's really why we must learn to take responsibility for our own actions and then repent. Ask the Lord to forgive us. Ask the Lord to cleanse us. Ask the Lord to wash us clean and make us holy and righteous in his eyes. Because repentance is the only way to have a right relationship with the Lord. That brings us to our last and final slide. The first judgment of God. The immediate result of man's choice to disobey rather than to obey God was judgment. There are four um, judgments or curses um, that come upon creation as a result of sin. That first curse, according to our chart is the curse on the devil. God said, because you tempted 
Adam and Eve, because you were subtle, I am going to cause you to go on your belly from here on out. That was a curse. You're going to be cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of your life. The second curse was on woman. That curse was about bearing children. When God cursed the woman, he said that childbirth was going to become extremely, exceedingly painful. In sorrow, she was going to bring forth children and her desire was going to be her husband and he was going to have the rule over her. The third curse was the curse on the land. Now, I don't know about you, but I am going to be getting into my yard in the next week or so, and I'm going to have to pull some weeds. Um, and man, I look around my yard and please don't come to my yard until I'm done. But there's weeds and all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but the Bible said that that curse on Adam was because you had hearkened to the voice of your wife and asked eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles, weeds, shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. So there was a curse on the ground. So the next time you go out and you're working in your garden, don't grumble too much, but it was Adam and Eve's fault. That's how our thorns and thistles and our weeds came to being. Then the fourth judgment was on man. That the effect of the curse on man, um, after God cursed the land, then God looked at Adam and he said, from the sweat of your brow, that's how you're going to have to work. You're going to have to sweat. It's going to take some hard labor and it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. From that point forward, man would find life a struggle. It would have to be done by effort, by um, work, by exertion. And that finally man would return to the dust from which he came. But there's always good news. And that's the good news that I've got to talk about before we end this Bible study. Just because there were curses, just because there um, were troublesome times that were coming ahead, God didn't leave them without promise. In fact, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. If you notice in the slide, there's this kind of weird key thing um, on that scripture. And, and that just really means it's just a promise of God. But I got super excited thinking about this promise and the timing of this Bible study. because. The promise is in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 was, Satan, you might have gotten the hand, the upper hand this time, but ultimately, I'm going to robe myself in flesh and I'm going to defeat you once and for all on the cross. You might have made a strike at my heel, but I'm going to crush your head. And that, y'all, is the promise of Easter. So I'm just so excited about that. God manifested himself in flesh and dwelt among us, the scripture tells us. And he lived and he taught. And on the cross, he gave his life for you and me. He broke that curse of sin 
that started in the garden. And then he was buried. And on the third day, just like we're going to celebrate on Sunday, he rose from the grave, conquering death and hell and the grave. What an awesome celebration that you and I can have this Sunday, knowing that the curse that started in the garden is finally broken, that we can celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and know that we can be free from the curse of sin. Now, do we still have to deal with weeds? Yeah. Uh, is there still sorrow in childbirth? Yeah. Um, is, is there still um, thorns and thistles? Yeah. Do we still have to work by the sweat of our brow? Yeah. But the one part of the curse that I had not touched that I've got to touch is that Adam and Eve were essentially separated from God on a spiritual level. And because of that curse, they were considered spiritually dead. But if you finish reading Genesis chapter 3, what you find is, is that God shed blood and he took um, skins and he covered Adam and Eve. And he said, you might have tried to cover your own sin, but you couldn't do it. But through the shedding of blood, your sin, praise God, can be covered and forgiven and washed away. Now, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. The Bible tells us that God set cherubim there to, to guard the gate. But God still made a way. His promises are true. His word is true. Now, I see several people have joined us. They've been watching for a while. Has this been helpful? Have you gotten maybe a little nugget or two? Um, come back next week. Same time, same station, same page. Um, next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to talk about the time frame between the fall of man to the flood. Um, that's considered the time of conscience. Um, so we're going to talk about that time frame. Um, and I haven't seen any comments um, or anything other than Aunt Jewel. Um, but uh, saying, yes, amen. I love you, Aunt Jewel. Um, but God bless you. Please feel free uh, once this video is done processing. If you'd like to share it, um, feel free to do so. Um, if not, that's okay, too. Um, I just think we might as well use the Internet and Facebook specifically um, to spread the word of God. I shared this on our church channel um, Tuesday night, and I said, you know, the Bible prophesies in the end that the word of God is going to be preached throughout the world. And I just think that Jesus could use Facebook to do that. And so I just want to be absolutely a part of that. So I love you all. I hope you all come back. I hope that um, we can just share the word of God and um, just enjoy his presence. And um, so before we end, let me pray for you and uh, then we'll we'll end this live. So pray with me, Jesus. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your truth. Thank you for the little nuggets that we can find in your word and make them applicable to our lives. God, I praise you for the gift of Facebook Live where we can share your word and share your truth. God, I pray that as your word promises that your word would go forth with signs following Jesus. You said if we cast our bread upon the water that it would come back pressed down, shaken together and running over. So Jesus, multiply your word for your glory and I'll thank you for it all. Bless everybody that was able to watch tonight. Strengthen them and encourage them. Protect them, oh God, in this time of 
social distancing, God, and may they feel your arms surrounding them, even in the lonely times, even in the scary times, Jesus, you are a faithful friend. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayer. Thank you, God, for loving us, Jesus. Continue to draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I love y'all. See y'all next week.